our meeting, the 15th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2014. We have apologies this morning from Linda Fabiani. Um, could everyone please make sure that they have their mobile phones and electronic devices on either silent or switch to airplane mode, please? And that allows us to start with agenda item one. The first item of business today is a decision on whether to take item four, which is our consideration of the committee's work programme in private. Do members agree? Okay. That's agreed. That takes us to agenda item two. The second item of business today is the committee's third evidence session on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. In previous weeks, we took evidence from both local authorities and third sector organisations on the bill. But this week, we're taking evidence from users of the Scottish Welfare Fund, as well as representatives of non-traditional banking and COSLA. We will round off our evidence taking on the bill next week with evidence from the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, the Office of the Social Fund Commissioner in Northern Ireland, and the Minister for Housing and Welfare, Margaret Burgess. But this morning, we have our first panel, and I'd like to thank various organisations who worked with us to enable us to have a panel here today. And we're joined by Connor, by Laura, Charlene, Peter and Lana. We've invited you here today to share your experiences of the Scottish Welfare Fund and the committee will ask you a range of questions. We are keen to hear about what you think worked well and anything that you think could have been improved. This could be uh, about any aspect of the process, from the application to receiving the grant to your uh, interactions with the Scottish Welfare Fund staff. However, if at any point you feel uncomfortable or that you don't wish to answer, that is entirely okay. Simply signal to me and we can move on to the next questions. So I'd like to kick things off with the first question. And in general, you can indicate to me who wants to answer, but can you tell us how you were first made aware of the Scottish Welfare Fund and what was your initial impression of that fund? When I moved in my house, I lived with my big sister at first. Then she moved out. I took over the house, and that's when I had to put the community care plan. Right. So you, you had already been working with an organisation who were aware of the Scottish Welfare mm -hmm. Fund. You hadn't heard of the Scottish Welfare Fund yourself. No. But you were looking for some assistance, and Bernardo's pointed you towards mm -hmm. the Scottish Welfare Fund. Is that something that you all recognise, or did you find? your way to the, the welfare fund yourselves? Well, it's your job centre, basically. Right. So we did. They laid me. It was a community care grant first, and then they said to me, apply for it. So, right. but I've had a bad experience with it, so... OK, well, maybe we can wait yeah, that later when we talk about your experience. <laughs> but we're just trying to find out. We've had a lot of evidence that, for example, job centres who previously administered the fund, but it's been transferred now to the Scottish Government and then on to local authorities to administer. But some witnesses that we've had previously have told us that they were not signposted, as it's called, by the job centre. So your experience is that it was... I got, I got my information through the job centre and plus one parent family Scotland who I'm with at the moment. OK. Laura, did you want to... It was through a friend that I found out. Okay. I actually didn't know anything about it, and it was a friend that had passed the information on to me that it was there to help. I thought they'd just kind of done away with it altogether, and they'd done away with the community care grant. Mm -hmm. I thought that was it. But my friend pointed me in the direction, and that was how I came to you. So had you had experience of the community care, care grant before? Yeah. Yeah, I'd had experience of the community care grant when I first took on my house. Right. And then I knew it had been done away with, and I thought that was it, like the help wasn't needed anymore. And then a friend had pointed me. Someone else told mm -hmm. you it was still there. Connor? Um, <clears throat> well, I actually heard about it through my brother. Um, he had used it for a crisis grant um, prior to me, so um, I had went to him and asked what it was all about. He explained it to me, and I then used the crisis grant myself, because um, I'd lived in care since the age of eight, so... Um, I didn't really have much knowledge of that kind of thing. Right. There's only one person not answered, Charlene. Did you, how did you find out about it? Yeah, I found out about it through the job centre, um, through my advisor, my personal advisor had told me, because obviously I was uh, getting a new flat and stuff. Um, and at the same point, I thought it was still the, uh, the community care grant. Um, and it wasn't, it had obviously been changed, but there was no 
there was no um, information before that to say that it had actually been changed right. until I actually got my own my own flat and then that's when I found out that it had been changed. So I think there was a lack of information before it. But the job centre staff volunteered the information? <coughs> you didn't have to ask I them did. about it? No, they... no, they, they, they gave me the information. I told them that I was moving uh, into my own tenancy for the supported accommodation that I was living in. Um, and they told me that it was you had to go through the welfare rights and it was at John Street in Glasgow oh. that you had to go to if that's what you wanted. OK, I'll open up to committee members to ask any other questions that could take us forward at the minute. Ken? Yeah, thanks, thanks. No, Can I ask you, you've obviously experienced both systems. What, what, what was your experience of the old system and how does it compare to...? I think the new system is better, like, that you get the stuff, because I think the stuff was really helpful to me anyway. And I think the way people maybe treated the old system wasn't very good. So I think now that you get stuff, and the stuff that I've got was really good, and they were really helpful. They came and they brought it to me and they fitted it and stuff for me, so I found it very helpful. I see. So you, were you asking for... The, so you weren't asking for crisis support, you were asking for uh, no, furniture was, and stuff? Uh -huh. for, yeah. Hmm. And uh, so the old system would be administered by the DWP, but the new one's by the local authorities, is that right? Mm -hmm. And they just, they just found them more supportive? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh. That's good. <coughs> Lana, you didn't sound so encouraging about it. Yeah. Well, I applied for the new one, this social welfare fund. Um, at the moment, I was basically, I applied for that one, but I got told off my social worker. She applied for the one in Glasgow, and it was a basically crisis. I had to flee my house. Um, it's a crisis load, I suppose, in the community care. I have yeah. as well, and I got, I've got three kids. Right. Um, and I lost my purse. I phoned them up and I had to wait 48 hours to right. get a reply and that was on the Monday. I got a reply back on the Thursday and I got given £38 mm -hmm. to last me from the Thursday to the Monday. Mm -hmm. And my child, my youngest son, was only six months old at the time. Mm -hmm. So the £38 had to cover basically nappies, electricity, gas and things like that. Oops. And I had to get even get bus fare to actually go up to the place and I was out without 48 hours without even knowing if I was actually going to get anything from them. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't... So, so you phoned first and there was, there was a big delay until yeah, it was actually... 48 hours they said to me that they were going to get back to me within the 48 hours. Okay. I had to actually phone up myself and chase it up to see actually what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. And then they finally told me that there was a payment waiting um, in John Street for me. Mm -hmm. And when I explained to them that I couldn't get up there, <coughs> they said to me, well, you're going to have to because your payment's sitting here, which was only £38. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that ain't going to last me for the yeah. Thursday to the Monday to get me everything that I need. Yeah. But they weren't helpful again. They weren't helpful. Okay. So. Can I also check? Um, they gave you cash. Did they...? It was a, yeah, it was, it was a... Or was it? Cat, no, it was card. a, a cheque thing. A and check? I took it to the post office. Right, OK. okay. Anybody else have a, a crisis grant? Anyone apply for a crisis grant? It's quite all right. Um, <clears throat> I applied for a crisis grant, a grant about a year ago. Um, I had applied because at the time I had turned 18, which meant supports from social work and stuff had to end. Um, and I had just lost my college placement, so I was having to sign on with the job centre. Uh, I had applied for it because I was told by the job centre I was going to have to wait between six and eight weeks before I would get anything. Um, and as I had said earlier, I had went and spoke to my brother, who told me to apply for that. When I did, the, um, I didn't exactly have a great experience. I got thirty pound, um, but when I was speaking to the person on the phone, it just felt as if they were kind of looking down their nose at me and judging me quite a lot. Um, I also felt as if I had to lie to them because at the time I lived in a supported care placement, which I still do, but. Supported care placement just means that you're responsible for yourself. You need to be independent with things like your finances and all other types of things mm -hmm. to a certain extent because you're it's one step shy of being in, a, in your own house. And I just kind of felt as though if I had told the person on the phone that I was in that placement, that I wouldn't have got the crisis one because they maybe not have seen me as someone in a crisis. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, how, and, uh, how quickly did it take to deal with your application? Did you, did you buy the phone, by the way, or did you? Yeah, I don't buy the phone. I, I was the same as um, Lana. Lana. I waited 40 hours before I, got, I had phoned them, and they had said they were going to go speak to the decision maker and see mm. um, what the decision was going to be. I didn't get a phone call till 40 hours later, and yeah. then I had to go up and collect a cheque and take it to my post office. But that was two days you're mm -hmm. skinned. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Charlene or Peter? Or, or no? uh, and just on, on the community care uh, application as well, did you apply for that as well? Did you? Yeah, I will ask on the same. Sorry about getting hanged. No, no, don't worry. Um, at the moment, I've had to leave my house. I'm still in the house at the moment, but I'm trying to leave due to domestic violence and trying to get out of the situation. Yep. Um, I'm in a private accommodation that's fully furnished at the moment. Um, and I've also managed to get myself an unfurnished house in a different area, which I had to leave. I phoned up for a community care grant. Um, it was my social worker that actually phoned up first. She applied for the Glasgow one, and I got she got told over the phone she's a, she's definitely entitled to definitely all her white goods, everything that she needs, all the help. But because I moved to the Western Bartonshire department, she had to phone up them. So when she spoke to them on the phone, they said to her, right, that's fine, get her to phone. So I had to phone up to clarify all my information. Mm -hmm. They told me that I wasn't entitled to nothing. And that mm -hmm. um, I'm not allowed any help with any white goods. I'm not allowed any help with the crisis. I'm not allowed any help with anything. Mm -hmm. So basically my experience now is I'm sitting in this house that I'm trying to get out of, mm -hmm. but I can't afford to get everything that I need for my kids to move into this house. And there's they are not being helpful with me whatsoever. And the person that I spoke to over the phone was extremely cheeky. Mm -hmm. And he was asking me so many, much personal questions that I didn't really actually feel as though they needed to be asked mm -hmm. because they knew the information from my social worker. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I'm still sitting in this house. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get help from One Parent Family Scotland to see if I can get any help to get any white goods, to get anything else. Mm -hmm. But according to the community care grants and according to the Western Bartonshire, because I'm making myself homeless, and because I've not made myself homeless with them and they've not rehoused me, I'm not entitled to anything. Whereas I'm entitled to something with the Glasgow one, but not the Western Bartonshire. Are they basically suggesting you stay with Glasgow? Is that what they're... Well, they're just saying, basically, I've, I've actually got my lease and I've, actually, I've got my keys and everything for this new house. I'm just mm -hmm. waiting to get into it. Mm -hmm. But, you see, the thing is, I need to leave this area because of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And they're not willing to help me any way, shape or form. And I don't know who else I can go to, apart from my one parent family in Scotland, that have been excellent. Can I just pick up on one further point, which is uh, both uh, Connor and Lana, you both talked about being judged or yeah. feeling that the conversation you had with in your application was uh, cheeky or intrusive yeah. or whatever else. Uh, did anybody else feel similarly in the way you've been dealt with? Or stigmatised all the time with that kind of stuff, if you want to if you need help with the job centre, like crisis loans or anything with today with furniture and stuff, you're, you, young people are stigmatised all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you go for a crisis loan and stuff, people just see you as Jake Balls and all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, but they don't know the circumstances of why people need to get crisis loans or why people need to get furniture for their own flat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I share your, your feelings there with how <coughs> you can get a welfare fund for your flat because I was denied um, funding to get white goods and obviously carpets yeah. and stuff for my own tenancy. I had to save up for months and months. Um, when I got my job I had to save up so I was living with, with nothing um, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I totally see how I see it as a, as a negative thing, the welfare rights. I see it as a positive. Yeah. It kind of seems... If you fit the right face, then you'll get what you want. Mm. But if you don't fit that face, then you don't get it. And I think that's the issue that some of us face with mm. that, um, that we do get that stigma hoarded against us. And it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't. Be. We should all be entitled to mm. have like furniture in our house, but we don't have that, and we can't get that. Um, and I find that strange. Give you an explanation which you understood because you, you obviously feel as though they've judged you. But did they give you any because explanation as to how they, you know how they had arrived at their decision so that you could assess whether you felt as though they had judged you? Because properly? I was starting a job in September, they told me that they couldn't help me 
once I started that job in September, I could be able to fund uh, my own furniture. But bearing in mind it was a 16-hour contract, 16-hour week contract, so how am I meant to fund my bills, my rent, uh, my furniture? It's impossible for somebody to do that on 16 hours. Um, but on, like, being able to, to save up money, I got the furniture that I needed. It wasn't great, but it was something to live with. But I, I just feel as that being my local authority and obviously the government putting this into place, that should be available for us, no matter what, you know what I mean? And it was partly because I had put in for a community care grant like two years ago and they told me that I couldn't put in for the welfare rights. Um, want to obviously get furniture for my flat and I just, I, I find it a bit strange that they're denying young people that are trying to move on, that have had maybe know the best experience of life and try to make a home for themselves and they don't get that they don't get that help and they don't get that support and I think that's what, what it's lacking and um, like yourself, you know, it's frustrating when all you want to do is make your home a home and you can't because people are denying to help you no, you're entitled to inform me on that opinion. I don't know when I share that. Uh, Jamie, first, sorry. Thanks. Uh, convener, obviously, the, the Scottish Welfare Fund has now been administered um, by the local councils. And Lana, you've already talked about how you've had contact with other parts of your local authority. And I'm just wondering uh, how, if each of you have had contact with other parts of the local authority. And I don't need to know the details, that's your private business. But I suppose the question is if you've had that contact with other parts of the local authority, you know, how have they or have they sought to make you aware of the welfare fund that they are administering in their area? Because it was quite striking that none of you said that you became aware of the welfare fund through the local authority. So maybe the question is, maybe the answer is, no one has made you aware. But you know, I put the question out there: has when you've been dealing with another part of the local authority, be it housing or whoever? Have they said to you, by the way, there's this uh, Scottish Welfare Fund, which is another part of the council ministers? No. no, I've not been aware of it. Is that, no. the, is that the case for everyone? Well, I had a few Bernardos. Mm -hmm. when, when I moved down to my own mm -hmm. I met the Bernardos and they, and they helped me with it all. But the, in the forum, I came yeah. from them, because I wouldn't do it myself. But the council didn't uh, tell you anything no. about it, Peter? And is that the case for everyone? I wonder if you wouldn't mind telling me what council area each of you live in. Yeah, I'm in Glasgow. Okay. Glasgow. Glasgow. Uh -huh. I'm in North Lanarkshire. Okay, so there's two from North Lanarkshire and three from, from Glasgow. Okay, that, that, that's, that's helpful. Okay. And um, this is a wider question. Obviously, the arrangements that have been in place thus far have essentially been a, a temporary arrangement. It's been an agreement between the government and uh, the local authorities uh, to administer the Scottish Welfare Fund. But now we've got this bill, which we'll consider as a parliament to try and put the scheme in permanently. So, and you've already been uh, hinting at it, but I suppose it's an open uh, question. What, what's worked well uh, from your experience of it so far and what, what could be done better? Fitting, they were going to fit a new line home in my kitchen, but they said they couldn't do it because I had a car and they could catch something off my car, so they, so they went so they went away. And then I had to make another appointment for them to come back out. Okay. They said because I had a car, they could get a disease or something off or something, something like that. And I was just looking like, well, that's, that's, that's a car, it's a house car, so it won't. So then I had to phone up to make another appointment. I do think it's a good thing, like, you know how we community care grants, we used to get them into our bank accounts, right? Now, let's be honest, right? I'm young, I get hundreds of money into my bank account, I'm not going to go and spend it on furniture, I'm not going to, and it, if I've got an addiction or something like that, I'm, I'm not going to go and spend it on furniture, so I see the welfare fund in that sense, fantastic, because then they're coming out, they're putting the goods into your house, they're putting your carpets down, um, so I see that as a positive rather than a negative. I see that as a really high positive. Uh, but on the other hand, like frustrated at the fact that I didn't get it mm -hmm. and that I didn't fit some of the criteria that they wanted to tick. 
that, that's an interesting perspective, Shannon, because we've heard some people have been critical of it, but I saw Lana yeah. agreeing. I don't know what others feel about that as being a positive that they'll come out and actually install yeah, because goods. Sometimes you find it difficult to actually, if you get, fair enough, you can get a new cooker, you can get anything like that, but it's who's actually going to mm-hmm. put that in for you. So it is, and lay the carpets for you and do these sort of things. So in a way, it is good because people are helping you do all that sort of stuff. So that way, it is good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Annabelle. Hey, thank you for this morning and thank you all very much for coming because it really helps uh, inform the work of this committee to have people who have had direct experience of making applications for the, the uh, Community Care Grant and the Crisis Grant. Um, picking on, on a couple of points that have already been um, raised, um, first of all, in terms of the mechanics of actually applying, was that all, for all of you on the telephone? Was it telephone and a big long form? Was it a mixture? Was it a face-to-face telephone for you? What about you, Laura? It was online. Online? Connor? Yeah, it was a telephone. Telephone? I was application form. Application form? Telephone. Telephone. And um, we've had, a, a, I think, at least one witness come in a previous session uh, to suggest that there should be a, a facility, at least for a face-to-face meeting, uh, at least that that would be a possibility along with telephone, online and paper. What, what would you think about that? Would that have made a big difference to, to you or were you quite happy with doing it online, on the phone? I think I prefer it face to face. I get dead stuttery and things like that when I'm on the phone. <coughs> I get un, I get all unfra- frustrated and things like that when I can't explain myself correctly. But see if I was to actually sit down with someone and they, they can actually see that I'm being genuine that I'm not just phoning up just to make a, a claim, basically, then, to be honest with you, yeah, I'd probably find that a lot more helpful and more be- beneficial for people. What about you, Peter? Uh, I'm the same. I like face-to-face. Mm-hmm. Charlie? Uh, I don't think the application forms are pretty good. Because um, when you go online, it's like pages and pages and pages. Yeah. And that can be quite disturbing for somebody filling that in. Um, especially if they've got writing or reading problems. Um, and telephone, I find it difficult to talk to people on the phone. <laughs> um, so I definitely face to face, I think that should be incurred into how to apply for it. Laura? So online was quite good, but I'd also applied on behalf of someone else. Okay. And I think that face to face, that would have been easier for the person that I applied for because it gives them the chance that they could have done that by themselves. Mm -hmm. It was just they have hearing difficulties and stuff, so they couldn't go on the phone and do it. So I think face-to-face it would have been a lot easier for them. But my experience doing it online was... But I think other people have Mm -hmm. different capabilities and stuff, so they'll see things more different and more difficult. Mm -hmm. Connor? Yeah, I, I would definitely say face to face would be better because I think, you know, having applied through the phone, you, you feel it's a, quite a lot of the time you feel as if they don't recognise you as a person. They just see you as a voice behind a phone looking for money. And I think if you're with somebody face to face, they can see that the reality is you're a human being who's got nowhere else to turn. Mm-hmm. That is why you are applying for that grant, whatever it may be, community care or crisis grant. Mm-hmm. So I think for both sides, it would be good to actually be able to have that kind of face-to-face meet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 mm-hmm. that's, that's what I had to fill out. Well, get help to fill out, because I wouldn't debt mm-hmm. myself. Because mm-hmm. Fatima's information. You had to get assistance to fill out. Aye, Bernardo's, uh, mm-hmm. I've got a worker with him help me do it all, because I wouldn't debt it myself. Because Fatima had questions. C- can I ask, in picking up a point that Jamie, uh, my colleague, um, uh, alluded to, uh, and, and where, and again, you know, not for each of you to go into your personal circumstances, that's your private information, but in circumstances where somebody already has involvement with the local council, social work level, as Lana said, or whatever, would um, you be happy if, if there was some mechanism to allow the information that social work, for example, in Lana's case, already had, already, they have all this information on their file already, for that information to be passed to the people dealing with the welfare fund. Yeah, You'd, and with the, because there are issues that are important issues of confidentiality and yeah. and so on. But do you feel that there might be a way that would allow the information to be passed so that 
you would have to spend less time giving the same information that they yeah. might already have access to. Would I that think be definitely, something? Definitely, because would you call it, it makes it a lot easier as well if they can see that you're actually sitting telling the truth mm -hmm. and there's another person mm -hmm. that can actually clarify everything that you're saying mm -hmm. and things like that and it can actually hold, they've got the information and they're just confirming everything that you're saying and things like that, I think it would be beneficial. Would anybody have concerns about that being passed to other officials in the council, that information about you? Obviously you should be able to be able to turn and say yes or turn and say no if you want that information, but I think if you are well, if you're wanting it to go ahead, I think you should be it should be going, definitely. Especially if it's going to help you to get the things that you need. Um, I, I think it should very much be your decision how much that they get to know. Um, certainly myself, having been in the care system and stuff like that, it's not necessarily something that you want your entire family background passed on to True. this person. But I think there are a lot of circumstances that they need to understand. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think, again, I kind of felt like I had to lie. When I was on the phone, I didn't say that I was in care. I said that I lived Manny because I just felt as though if they had known that, if I had told them that, I wouldn't have got anything. Um, so I think it would help for them to know those bits of information and sort of mm -hmm. your actual circumstances. But I think you should very much be in control of how much they get to know. One other question, um, I, I, and all of you were talking about how you came to be aware of the, um, the fact that there, there was at least uh, this possibility of, of uh, applying for a uh, community care grant or a, a crisis grant, uh, and none of you said that it came directly from local authority. Thinking for other people going forward, what, what like yourselves, what do you think would be um, a better way to try to communicate the availability of this fund? in terms of something that would be more directly meaningful and accessible to your lives and lives of, of people that you know, what would be a better way then to let people know that there is this fund there? If you have any ideas, that would be great. I think maybe when people like take one on your tenancy, if maybe your housing association or landlord have some sort of information to let you know about it, mm -hmm. or if there's maybe... <coughs> notices of it in like your house association or whatever mm -hmm. to let people know that the help's there. Okay, that's a very practical um, suggestion. Mm -hmm. I think it is just about getting the information out there because it is not really out there still. Um, you only find out if obviously you get your own flat and things like that and I think if we, we try and figure out is there a certain way that we, we get that information out like, I had a social worker when I had my own flat, but my social worker never told me about the, the welfare rights. Um, and I think uh, the lack of local authorities, local authorities should know that. They're, they're our corporate parents, you know. Um, and they should be looking out for our safety and well-being. Um, and if they don't know that information, how are we meant to know that information? And it is just about being able to get that information out to to young people or people in general, um, but how you get that is it's a difficult one. Um, but definitely, like social workers and stuff, should be pro promoting that kind of stuff. Okay, well that's two very practical suggestions. Thank you for that, and I'll see if my colleagues have further questions for you. What I'm doing, I just, uh, for the record, the, the, the form um, that Peter mentioned um, that he had to complete for North Lanarkshire Council runs to 25 pages. So if anyone's wondering just ex how extensive the information is, that's that's how much it is. Uh, way more than you would have to fill in for a passport. But um, that's, uh, that's a matter of judgment whether the information that they're looking for is actually essential. I mean, uh, having looked at it, again, just for information, it asks you a lot of questions up front about your ethnicity and various other things, but they're questions that could be checked after a, a forum has been completed. You know that, that when people then go back to to get additional information that might be useful to the type of people who are coming to make applications, um, but it might be a bit off putting for people to be asked those types of questions up front because it makes you think, or does it make you think? Why are they asking that? What, what difference does that make when I'm filling in this form? Did any of you have that consideration? I can see a few of you nodding. Yeah, yeah. So, 
it's none of their business to know anything else. See what we're applying for. We're applying for stuff for a flat or money to help us um, have a better home and stuff. Um, so it shouldn't matter. And I think the forms really need to be looked at because I just don't think it's right. 25 pages, come on. <laughs> Who wants to sit and fill 25 pages in just to get furniture for their flat? It's ridiculous. Um, so if they kind of break that down to maybe two or three pages, how they can do that, I don't know, because, well, if they take out all the personal stuff that doesn't need to be in there and stuff that they don't need to know, then I think the forms would be a bit better for people to actually sit in and fill in. Laura, do you agree? I think you nod and so. It's a bit long. Like Maybe they could take like kind of important information that's to do with what you're applying for. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of information that's for in the form that's really... Just personal information? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not really so much to do with like, what you're looking for kind of thing. I think maybe if they wanted to know any more information, they could contact you in some way. If, it, if it's a wee bit more information that they think they need to know, then... They should contact you, I think. But the after the process has been uh -huh. completed. I think they're a bit off putting the forms as well. Because you'll get people that may look at them and think, God, and the form will put them off. Yeah. Okay. Kevin. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I agree about the forums. I mean, I really don't understand why they want to know your ethnicity or your religion or, or things like that. That should have absolutely nothing to do with us at all and it would be interesting convener to see forms from other authorities to see if they're all exactly the same going back to the the point so about getting information out there um and we go into certain places and there are posters galore and all of the rest of it which you know we don't really pay very much attention to uh doctor surgery you could spend probably a week reading all of the posters that are on a wall can I ask, in terms of your tenancies, did you at the very beginning of your tenancies get a handbook, a handy facts handbook from your your landlord, whether that be council or, or housing association? And if you did, do you think that information about this, the welfare fund should be in that handbook? Charlie? No. No. Peter? Don't remember, I don't know. Lana? No. no. Laura? Connor? I've never been in my own tenancy, so right. I couldn't say. So all of you that are in your own tenancies at this moment in time never got any real information from your landlord when you moved into that property. Right, I think that's very, very interesting, convener. And I think, again, we should probably look at best practice that's happening across the country because I think these little things can often help. And if, you, if you've got that book and you can put it away and take it out as necessary, I think that's always helpful. Um, Charlie mentioned corporate parents um, and obviously Connor you've said you've come from a, a, a care background as, as well uh, how do you think that your corporate parents which include us by the way um, perform in terms of helping you get to the initial stages of starting off in life um, and I think the issue is a lot of people don't know that they're a corporate parent. Um, and I think that's where the issue is, that people don't know that they're a corporate parent. Um, and if people knew that they were a corporate parent... Because I've spoke to like people for NHS and stuff who I've mentioned corporate parenting to them, and they're like, hey, what's that? And I'm like, well, you deal with people every day, so you're looking after their safety, you're making sure that they're... Their well-being's all right. Um, so I, I think then it all comes down to information. It all comes down to information and the lack of information that's out there for people. Um, so as corporate parents, we're failing you and not providing me, you with the information for me, that you I, need to for me, get I, on with life. Not just for me, but the other hundreds of kids and young people and people out there in general, they're feeling. Do you feel the same way, Connor? Um... Well, I think myself and Charlene have got slightly different experiences of corporate parents. I've kind of experienced both battles. Um, and in times gone by, I had quite a lot of different support from corporate parents. But I think um, one of the things, the older you get, the less support that corporate parents will provide you. Um, I mean, I'm 19. A year ago, I had turned 18, and almost all form of support 
from my local authority was taken away from me just because I turned 18. Now, for me, that's a bit... At that point, I'd been within local authority care and been in the care system for 10 years. These people had been looking after me and being responsible, and then they just pulled a plug like that. And for me, it's like, at 18, not everybody's ready to make a, a huge step like that into their own kind of a um, tendencies or whatever it may be. And I think, again, there is a whole lack of information thing that there are networks out there for after you turn 18 and stuff, but people don't know that they're corporate parents, and people don't know how to... There's people who aren't corporate parents, who are young people like myself and Charlene, who don't actually know who their corporate parents are, and they don't know who they can turn to. Um, so, I, again, I think I would echo what Charlene said. There has to be better communication, um, but at the same time, there has to be better preparation from corporate parents when they're... Because they don't phase you, they just pull the plug, like, it's like turning a light switch off. Yeah. And how on earth, like, when I had lost the kind of supports I needed, I had just lost a college placement. Um, things weren't exactly great. I didn't have anything going for me. That was then pulled for me, and I'm left in a position where, well, where do I turn now? So I think it is that sort of preparation and gradually phase people to a point where they are ready. So I'm 46 and I still run back home to mummy and daddy um, to get advice and information at certain points. Um, and you don't have that after, as you say, at that cut-off point, point. At a certain point, you don't. like. Um, I have still got a social worker just now, um, but it's the bare minimal of support that I receive. Um, and it's like you say, in normal family life, you know, at 46, you'll still go back. My uncle is 59. He still lives with my granddad. You know, he looks after my granddad, don't get me wrong, but, you know, that kind of thing is, like, how can... Like, a corporate parent is just another word for parent, essentially. And they're supposed to be like a family, yet when you get to that certain point, they're just not interested anymore. And it's really not... To me, anyway, it's just really not a fair thing to do and it's all about information and communication and mm. we're not getting that right can i ask one final question convener and that's uh, obviously um you're here today and you're here because organizations who have helped you um have have put you forward um to be witnesses here today um what would it be like coping without these organizations to help you and point you in the direction of the, the right places to go, including for the Social Welfare Fund. Charlene, do you want to go first? Um, to be honest with you, um, I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for the organisations if it's that's helped me um, to get to where I'm at now in life. Um, and it's pretty good for me to be sitting here today because... I've kind of moved on with my life and I've got my flat sorted and I've got I've had all the support and and I now work and I'm now a peer housing support worker and I give out the welfare rights information that a housing association should give out. So it's for me it's it's a like a privilege and I sit and I study it all the time, like always printing stuff off. Um so for me I've experienced it's been good to work with organisations and be supported and now be on the other side of that and giving it the right information to young people and just people in general. Thank you. Peter? I wouldn't have my own, I wouldn't have my own house. I wasn't for like Bernardo's or everybody else. I would have been like still with my sister if I didn't have anybody else. So it's quite good. OK, thanks. Lana? Um, for me, at the moment, I'm in the middle of doing a training with One Parent Scotland to basically be somebody to help other One Parents to give them rights, to tell them their rights for benefits and things like that. So without that organisation, then I wouldn't be able to help other people. So for me, it's really good. It's helped me quite a lot, and especially at the moment with the circumstances that I'm in, it is extremely helpful, so it is. Thank you. Laura? At the moment I'm working with One Parent Family Scotland and I've just recently done welfare reform course and for me that's been really good because it now gives me the information that I can pass on to other people 
that's maybe in a situation that I've been in that One Parent Family Scotland's helped me out of so now I can pass on the information and help other people and tell them, pass them the right direction where to get help and stuff. So. Corey? Um, well, I, I currently work with Who Care Scotland and, you know, for me, I, Who Care Scotland's a big, big reason for me being able to even be here today in front of yourselves. Um, one of the great things about what I do there now, I've got a chance I can go out and I speak to different, all different types of corporate parents and stuff like that, um, and help to try and influence change, even if it's just small change. Because um, well, for me, if I change one person's mind, that's good enough. That's that's change enough. Um, but one of the other things I get to do that I love doing, um, and it's only in the past maybe three four months that I've started doing it since my job role kind of changed. Um, in terms of things like we're talking about information, part of my job is actually like some of the more complex and bits of information that people maybe can't understand, like young people can't understand, like for example, 25 page application forms that are just nonsense. Um, I, one of my tasks is to take forms like that and change it into simple terms, change it into something that's easier for people to understand. Um, and I, I, I love doing that because I can relate I've been in the situation where you read something or you see something or, you know and it's just total jargon and you just think what is uh, exactly am I supposed to do with this but complete gobbledygook basically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sure I'd probably understand half the forms better if it was gobbledygook <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot folks thank you convener Ken you want to come back in Could I just, uh, just a couple of other questions um, have any of you ever been offered vouchers or cards when you've been looking for crisis payments? No, none of you. And also, Lani, you spoke very well about you, you, when you were given community care uh, furniture, you, you were pleased that they fitted it for you and so on. No, sorry, it was you, Shirley, it was you, Shirley, who said that. Uh, were you offered a choice at all? I'm just trying no, to... no, I was just speaking about like how they... It's good in a sense that they do bring the furniture out to your flat. I've mm -hmm. never had that. But I know of people who have had that and how they do fit things for you and they do make sure that it's all set up for you. Um, and I find that quite quite good. Um, and the fact that the furniture comes to you and the money doesn't come to you. Peter? I can't see they can fit my, my carpets and that and fit the plug my, my washing machine and everything else. So it's quite good. That's good, yeah. Now, I think we're, one of the issues we're looking at is, it goes back to the, uh, some of your comments earlier about the way you're treated, whether you're made to feel, whether you're respected as individuals and given choices or a say. And uh, it's, quite tr it's a tricky balance because clearly in, when it comes to the community care, the furniture packages and so on, actually, you know, it's the support you want as much as anything else. And whether the, the maker model of the machine makes no difference to you, it's just the support. Uh, but some of the some of the stories we've heard from uh, evidence we've heard suggest that uh, there's a lack of choice or a lack of respect. You know, giving you um, vouchers or no choice in furniture or being made to take um, furniture that's inappropriate. But you've not had a bad experience like that, any of you? That's fine. That's very good, in fact. Yeah, yeah, just, uh, thank you, Just a, a, a technical question following on from some of the, the evidence you've given. Um, so for those who had their applications turned down, um, first of all, were you uh, informed by the local authority, so in most cases, well, Glasgow or North Lanarkshire Council, that you would have, at least in, in theory, a right to appeal? And did any of you appeal your decisions that were rejecting your applications? The first time, okay. and then I didn't know until Bernardo's, <coughs> my working lad told me. So then I replied again, but I had to send in photos because my couch was broke okay. and my freezer was broke, so I sent in photos. So I looked at it again and then I got the okay. furniture. Okay, so it was it was a new application mm -hmm. in your case, Peter. Anybody but I, else? But I sent in photos of all my yeah, stuff. Yeah, and that, that was to enough see. to mm. change their minds. Anybody actually consider an appeal or did, did you have information that an appeal was possible? I um, I'd obviously filled the forum in um, 
and also been on the telephone to them. Um, but they says there was some information that was on the forum that needed to be filtered and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, it got put in, it got denied. So I sat down with one of my support workers, filled it in again, sent in an appeal, um, got denied again, sent it in again, <laughs> um, and I just kept on getting denied all the time. So that was three times that I put that in to still be rejected. Um, and it's quite, it's quite upsetting to be honest with you to be rejected for furniture, especially if you've had a care background and been in care and stuff. To, because all you want is furniture to make your your house a home. Do you know what I mean? That's all we want is, and whether you've been in care or whether you've not been in care, um, that's all people in general want is furniture. Don't care where it's fair or what it looks like. See if I've got a cooker and I can cook a meal on it and I've got a sofa that I can sit on. Happy days, mm -hmm. but I never got one bit of that. Lana, have you... I mean, I'm not quite sure where your current situation stands in terms of the application to well, Western Bartonshire Council. It's straight away and they didn't tell me that I could obviously appeal it. But if it wasn't for my training, then I wouldn't have known because they didn't tell me. Okay. So when I knew, because I'm doing my training, mm -hmm. I managed to say that I wanted to appeal it, so okay. I'm just waiting to hear. So you, you, are, you are in that process at yeah. the moment? Okay. So I just don't know what's happening with that yet. Okay, okay. thank you. Alex, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Thanks very much for that one. We've covered most of the subjects, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to go back on and ask specific questions about. Now, some of you have had experience of the previous scheme that existed uh, and have now had experience of the new scheme. But we've talked a lot about knowledge of the scheme, uh, knowledge of the, the fund and its availability. Now, how much has the problem of accessing the fund or knowledge of the fund been caused by the fact that there was a change? Is it one of these situations that the predecessor funds that were available, everybody knew about them? Everybody knew what you could do and it was the change in the, the name and the administration of the fund that left people not knowing it existed? Would that be fair to say? Well, the problem was with me. I didn't know that it existed anymore. It had changed and I just didn't know. I thought it had just been taken out of place and that was it. There was nothing to replace it. Uh, and we've already... Sorry. I thought that as well. I thought yeah. it had just been abolished. We've already heard that a couple of you at least are actually training up to pass on information about the new funds to other people. Do you think it's something that if we get continuity for a, a year or two, that knowledge of the availability of the fund will widen and people won't be left in a position where they, they need something, they qualify for it, but they simply don't know it exists. We hope, so. mm -hmm. we hope that it gets more, you have to get more information and more training so people mm -hmm. do, can go and tell people. So the, there's a new fund coming in with this bill, hopefully it mm -hmm. won't be too different from the one that we've been working for the past year or two, but there's a danger there that if there's radical changes, if we give it a different name, if yeah. we have a different process, then we might find ourselves back at square one as far as knowledge of the scheme is mm -hmm. concerned. Mm. Because quite a lot of people that I've talked to still, from this day, didn't even realise that it was still put in, it's still in place, but it's just a different name. Mm -hmm. So they were happy to know that it's still in place, but there is different ways that they've got to go around it now, obviously, but it's still in place, which as people didn't know yep. that it was put in place. The other thing that interested me for what we were talking about earlier on was the 48-hour wait. Sure. Now, one of the, the differences between the scheme we have now and the, the, the predecessor was that there used to be a 24-hour limit, mm -hmm. uh, and that was extended to 48, and there's, we've had various explanations of why it was extended to 48. But do you feel it was taking them the full 48 hours to process your claim, or were they just waiting for 48 hours because that's what it said in the scheme? To be honest with you, I can't, I can't answer that one, but in my circumstances, it was ridiculous. You've got children, and in my circumstances, I lost my purse, and to wait 48 hours just to wait ah. for a decision, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I think it should be changed back to the, the 24 hours. If not that, then a wee bit more, less, because mm -hmm. see, at the end of the day, when you're sitting with children for two to three days waiting for a decision, and you've not got anything because they're not waiting to see if no. you're going to meet this criteria to get anything. Or even if, the whatever the reason was for extending it to 48 hours, that may be valid. Mm -hmm. But even if we have the 48-hour limit, if they can turn it round in an hour, they should. Yeah, definitely. 
because uh-huh. it's an hour that you're le- less having to sit there and wait to see if you're entitled to get anything. Yeah. It's ridiculous. The 48 hours is terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I would, I would totally agree with Lana. I, I just, it, there's no way it takes 48 hours for them to make the decision. And, I mean, when you're applying, I applied for a crisis grant, which means I was in crisis. Mm-hmm. So how are you expecting me to wait for 48 hours knowing I'm in crisis? But at the same time, I think there is very much a sort of level of crisis type of scheme there in the respect that if they don't see it as much of a crisis mm-hmm. um, as the next call up per se, then they'll just prioritise that one and yours can wait the 48 hours. But I don't think it does take the full 48 hours. I think they leave it that long just because they can more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I say, I just don't think it's not even that. It's the fact that in that forty-eight hours, you don't know, you don't get any kind of contact mm-hmm. with anybody for that forty-eight hours. And in some cases, like Lana said as well, you actually have to go and chase it up. Yes, that shouldn't be happening. What if I've applied? I expect somebody to pick up a phone to me or something and let me know what is going on in the process of my application. Not have to chase them about for it. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we've exhausted all the questions, but given that you've come all the way through here to Edinburgh and you've got a, a line-up of politicians sitting in front of you, is there something before you leave here that you want to make sure we're aware of? Something when you were coming through today, you thought, I'm definitely going to tell them this. Get it off your chest. <laughs> <laughs> anything anything that, that you feel as though we haven't covered yet and you, want, you wanted to make sure we were aware of it when you were coming through here, because you, you've... Absolutely. <laughs> so, have you not had... Is there anything you've not had the opportunity to tell us that you wanted to tell us when you were when you were travelling through this morning? Make it a bit more spacious. Make it more easier. A wee bit more easier for lone parents, especially, because we're not in that circumstances for the reason... Do you know what I mean? So I think when we're applying for things, I think you, I think especially the forums and over the phone and things, I think people and especially the people that are actually speaking to you should be actually more given more training to understand that. Like, listen, we're in a some cir- circumstances. Don't sit and judge us because we're in the circumstances. We're needing your help. I think it should be made more clearer to people and more easier for us to apply for things instead of no, you're going to have to wait to see if you're entitled to this. You should make it a wee bit more easier and things like that and just say you should in fact you should just be able to give an answer within twenty four hours if you're gonna be entitled instead of having to wait two to three weeks to even hear if you're gonna get furniture or anything like that. I think it should be changed in some sort of way, especially for lone parents and people like yourself that are just coming out of care and things instead of like I don't mean this bad, but instead of like the alkies can come off the street or the junkies can come off the street and they're getting help with everything the way that we see it, and we're having to sit and wait and things like that, and it's it's annoying. I think you should just basically make it a lot more easier for people that actually aren't in this crisis and that actually need the help that they actually do instead of the people that actually just don't even need it as, as, as much as we do. Okay, thanks, Lana. Connor, you wanted to say something? All I wanted to say um, was that I think when you're making an application and you're speaking to people, I think they should be clearer about what information they can check and how they can check it. Because um, I didn't realise until a couple of weeks ago when a couple of people from the, the Parliament had come up to our office and had spoke to us about the Welfare Fund that these people can go and check your Facebook accounts and stuff like that to confirm the information you've gave them. And I think things like that, they should make crystal clear to people that they can go and check that type of information. But also at the same time, Facebook's not exactly the most reliable source of information either. Um, nor is any kind of social media. You know, there are things that might be on Facebook that aren't true. It happens. Um, my Facebook said I was 50 a week ago. I'm no 50. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's one of these kind of ridiculous things. And I just think it's about letting people know, um, but making it easier for them to be able to disclose things as well. I mean, I had to hide the fact that I was in care. I should never have had to do that. Mm-hmm. Someone should have actually asked me if I was in care, to be honest. That there should have been a question that, that should be one of the first questions. Um, but yeah, I, I think just that whole kind of a mm, the what they can find out, the what they can find and out, why about and how yeah. and why. Yeah. Okay. Well, on behalf of the committee, can I thank you very much? You've all been very 
open with us and it's been really helpful from my point of view and I'm sure my colleagues uh, share uh, that view that the, the information you've given us has really given us an understanding because we've spoken to professionals, we've spoken to people who are on the other side of it, the administrators, but to hear it from people who are on the receiving end, if you like, um, has helped us to, to get a greater appreciation of just how the system is operating. So uh, the time you've spent with us this morning has been really uh, beneficial and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the committee for the, the information that you've provided. Okay, thank you. And I'll suspend the meeting uh, for a period of time to be changed to our next panel.
for agenda item three. Agenda item three this morning is a welcome to our second panel, which consists of Dermot O'Neill, who is the Chief Executive of the Scottish League of Credit Unions, Nicola Dickey, Scottish Welfare Fund Development Manager at COSLA, and Jackie Cropper, Managing Director of Grand Central Savings. Uh, we've heard the evidence that there are some people who, although in need, may not uh, meet the agreed criteria for the Scottish Welfare Fund or qualify for a DWP budget loan. And because we've taken evidence on that, the, the committee felt it would be useful to explore what other options might be available, um, things that are not in the, the current bill, but are not, according to the, the information we've had from uh, government officials, not excluded from the bill either. Um, so the, pa the, the panel has been invited uh, to allow us to explore what alternatives to the, the, the grants and uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund make available uh, at the present time. Um, so uh, can I begin by asking oh. yourself, Dermot, obviously you have had a look at the, the bill. Do you see any scope within the bill for credit unions to want to become involved in that system or and if they, that was the case where would they fit in? I think there's very limited scope for credit unions to be involved as an alternative uh, to what's already been proposed and we've approached this from four main perspectives from a position of reputational impact um, from a position of commerciality from a position of responsible lending and borrowing and also from operational capacity uh, and again I suppose the key thing for us is around the re reputational considerations and a, a credit union's membership must be balanced and for credit unions to be healthy they need to attract a broad section of society and just now credit unions are saddled with an unfortunate and damaging misconception of being a poor man's bank and we would be concerned that any direct servicing of a welfare fund type payment directly from credit unions would simply reinforce that misconception and further tip the, the balance of, of, of membership profile. Jackie, your organisation was mentioned specifically to us. I mean, from your perspective, what's your take on, on what's just been said by Dermot or the question that I posed earlier? Well, obviously, Grand Central Savings does work with the most vulnerable um, people out there, um, from homeless to single parents to families who are struggling. And, um, and, and you've just now demonstrated why there's a need for Grand Central Savings, um, so I didn't have to do that there. Um, when it comes to um, facilitating loans, I'm not actually sure, even with the most vulnerable I'm working with, that that is the best way forward. Um, we're very much and very keen in working with people and working with their issues, um, not just, it's not just a service, it's money in and money out, but actually working with their issues and ensuring that they are managing um, the, their money, as sometimes as difficult as that can be. Um, and we are constantly, um, you know, I was very impressed with the, the, the people that were speaking um, earlier and, and they echoed a lot of views that I would have um, said um, here today, um, that people need to be um, managed much more better around the welfare fund and a much more communication. We're working with alongside different organisations and ensuring that the customers that we're working with are actually getting a fuller service and actually getting involved in making sure that they can actually apply for what their needs are. Um, so when it comes to loans, small loans, um, I'm not so sure that's the answer. I just think it'll put them further into debt, the people I'm working with. Okay. And it might be misused for some other people as well. well Nicola, I mean, you're obviously coming from the local authorities side of things. You're looking at the, the, the client group that, that you're dealing with. It. You'll have a view on you know, what, the, you know, as Jackie said, some of the downsides of considering uh, going beyond the Scottish Welfare Fund. Yeah, I mean... Certainly, when, when Local Government of Scotland took this on, loans was part of the original consultation. Um, <coughs> and looking at where we've got to with the Welfare Fund and listening to the evidence sessions that we've just had with, with some of the people previously, um, like Jackie, I'm not convinced that, that certainly putting them into more credit would, would necessarily be the way to, to help them out of that. Um, it doesn't fit with the, the enabling nature of the fund. The, the, the way that local authorities have approached the fund is to try and provide... Um, assistance, be it in cash or in kind, and also that wraparound support. Um, 
if that wraparound support, I think that would be a very difficult decision for decision makers then to come to if we were to include the provision of loans in the grant. It's a discretionary fund already, and we've, we've heard some of the, the good and the bad examples of that discretion. If there was a further um, part being added into that decision-making process about do you qualify for a grant, do you qualify for a payment, then do you qualify for a loan, I think that would be very difficult, and I think it would be very difficult for customers and decision makers to, to understand just exactly what was the decision making process and how do I have to pay it back but mm -hmm. you know, my next door neighbour didn't have to pay his back and I, I think that's something that we've, we've worked hard to, to, to get away from the, the concept of loans being available for um, from Scottish Welfare Fund for Crisis in Scotland and including it might start to muddy the water again maybe. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I'll open up to members and I'll go to Kevin first followed by Alex. Thank you, and I'd refer folks to the uh, Register of Members' Interests as I'm a member of St Macher Credit Union, uh, and I think that should be <coughs> on the record. One of the things which we've heard from the previous witnesses, and we've heard throughout our discussions round about this, is um, signposting and, and information. Do you think it would be um, wise um, for the folks handling these things at local authorities um, as well as to deal with the crisis or the community care grant at that particular point in time to give some further financial information to folks and say, look, you may want to consider joining a credit union um, at some point because that may help you um, get to a stage. If you do hit a future crisis, you might actually have something put away for a rainy day or if you want further choice than than what is being offered from the Scottish Welfare Fund. You know, if you put that aside, a little bit aside, then you may be entitled at a later date to a loan um, from a credit union. Dermot. Very pertinent point. I think that <clears throat> credit unions are best placed to serve members, not at a point of crisis, but at a, at a point of developing the habit of saving. And what we're talking about today is the need for immediate help uh, from a crisis situation. And very few credit unions are positioned to receive, process and turn around that crisis loan type need. Every credit union is absolutely positioned to accept a new member and educate them in the wise use of money. But that's a long term process and, and something that needs to be fostered with the individual based on their ability to save and from a position of borrowing based on their ability and inclination to repay as well. I, I, I think that's extremely useful, convener, and you know, I, I pay credit to um, the unions that there are throughout Scotland in, in terms of the, the information that they give out uh, in terms of how uh, to handle your cash. And um, I'm not ashamed to say that I've had a, a loan previously from a credit union um, to, to tide me over at a point which uh, was not so good. Uh, but obviously you have the backup of the previous saving and, and all of the rest of it above that. But I, th I think we're missing a trick in some regards, um, convener, because a, a lot of this, um, uh, the difficulties that are created is often because there is no stability. Um, and I think that stability can be provided uh, via credit unions. Mm. And I just think that, you know, as well as dealing with the crisis or the community care grant, if that further information was given to folk and directing them towards some of your organisations, then that would be useful for all. Mm -hmm. uh, and although you may be um, a, a, in a, a sticky wicket at certain points in your life, it may well be that in the future that, uh, that you're, you're able to put even more into your credit union account and thus create the balance that Dermot was talking about. Can I offer a comment on that? I think it's I think it's important as well that credit unions are able to manage the expectations of those approaching the credit union, and I think it would be I think it would be wrong to give an impression that credit unions can help in all circumstances. Credit unions can can only help when the member, the person, has the capacity to self help. And the self help involves both the capacity to save and in the event of borrowing the capacity to repay. I think an interesting thing around just around the commerciality of, of credit union loans, if I can, um, the, the viability, the commercial viability of credit unions engaging in this type of activity 
is, is very much also dependent on the, the level of borrowing, the value of borrowing, and the term of borrowing. So, for example, should a credit union lend £100 to a member over three months, the credit union would earn £2 in interest fr from that transaction. And the estimated cost of processing that loan is around £100. So for every £100 loan that's issued to a member over three months, the credit union is essentially affecting a net cost of £98 per loan. That can only be sustainable if the credit union has a, has a breadth of membership. That for every £100 loan that's been issued, so too are higher value, longer term loans. And this feeds back into the original point that yes, credit unions can help people, but to help people, they need to help all people and not just focus on a particular section of members who are in more desperate need um, for help. Jackie? <coughs> I certainly think that um, for Grand Central Savings, um, most of the people that we are working with, which is about 3,500 at the moment, um, are living chaotic lifestyles. They are um, homeless, they're in the street, they are um, in crisis every day. Um, and what we're trying to do is manage them out of their crisis, educate them, um, and basically get them ready for, for a credit um, union. And I think that, that that is a success story for Grand Central Savings. We're not, we're not around to try and give out loans. We're certainly not around to um, hopefully be here forever, um, you know. Um, so I, I absolutely 100% agree with what you've just um, said there. Um, I think that there is a lot of people um, out there who could take real advantage of a credit union. And um, if they came into us and we felt they were ready and they've now got work and they're, they're, they're now bringing in, we would actually have a meeting with them and actually advocate, um, you know, the, the fact that that's their next step. Um, so... I think that at the moment we, we're doing a wee joint piece of work with First Alliance. Um, um, I'm very keen to see how we can uh, work together and move people on. Um, and I think that credit unions should be focusing on the, the, the people who are not on the crisis um, at the moment and work with us closely so that we can actually help with what we're doing and actually have a seamless way of working with credit unions so we can actually move them on when they're ready and educated to how to manage and how to save. A, a slightly different question for Nicola Convener, because obviously some local authorities have formed very good partnerships with, with credit unions, but it seems that some welfare rights officers in, in certain places and um, uh, uh, are not quite so good at signposting folks on to other places or giving them advice about what's maybe going to be best for them in the future. How can we improve that? Um, beyond that, you know, again, some local authorities have got very good partnerships in terms of encouraging their own staff to join credit unions to create the balance that, that Dermot was talking about. Again, others don't. How can we ensure some kind of uniformity in terms of, of, of that signposting and that, that education about the, what, the benefits of, of, of continuing? Uh, I mean, way? certainly a lot of what is happening around the welfare fund is iterative. It's it's, it's an improving process, and <clears throat> and what we know is that you're absolutely right. Some local authorities have formed strong links with their credit unions. Um, we have examples in South Lanarkshire where they've managed to um, speak to their credit unions and actually work out exactly what is available from the credit unions and manage the expectation of customers who they're referring to the credit unions. Um, COSLA has obviously spent significant amounts of time looking at payday lenders and alternatives to high-cost high credit. And one of the things that came through in some of the evaluations that have been done is that the expectation is that there's a quick turnaround time. Customers are looking for cash to be available to them that day. Now, there are, there are very few credit unions who are able to service that type of demand. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose it's the halfway house. It's, not, it's never going to be the solution for the customers who are in absolute chaos. Um, and that's why I suppose we see it as separate from the from the welfare fund, and it's more about signposting. Once you've built up a, a relationship with that customer and you've been dealing with their, their crisis or their community care grant application, then working out whether 
the local credit union is able to, to service that. In terms of how we improve that across the breadth of Scotland, it is about sharing that good practice. It is about um, making sure that all of the local authorities are working with their local, their, their local area um, credit unions, but also the other stuff that's going on in terms of what's available elsewhere in Scotland. Um, and that, that sharing of good practice continues to go on across local government, not just in the area of credit unions, but on all of the other things that we've all learned so far in terms of the Welfare Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Uh, Alex and then Jamie. We have from a last panel that there are people who apply uh, and for various reasons uh, are turned down. And it's reasonable to consider uh, what alternatives we might provide uh, for people in these circumstances. And a short-term crisis loan seems like the sensible approach. So I think there is a demand in there, and what we're trying to establish here is who might fill that demand. Now, you mentioned payday lenders. Now, anybody that's driven into the predatory world of payday lenders uh, you know, is getting into a very difficult set of circumstances. But if there is demand for people uh, from people who would wish to uh, secure a loan uh, at reasonable cost to achieve the objectives. There seems to be a complete vacuum. Uh, we've heard today that it's not appropriate perhaps to steer everybody in the direction of a credit union. F the first question I have to ask is, do you think there is a demand there that is uh, unfilled and needs to be filled? <coughs> I, th I think, um, to, to quote your colleague, um, Kezia Dugdale, she has often used the phrase, um, there's too much month left at the end of the money. Uh, and it's something that I think strikes absolutely with that, with that notion that when someone has insufficient income or disposable income to live, then the natural reaction is to seek credit to bridge that gap. And that solves one problem and creates another. And the inherent danger for credit unions to ex of extending credit, however affordable, is that you further in debt the member, which is, runs contrary to credit unions' principle as responsible lenders. Credit unions, and in fact any lender, needs to be able to demonstrate that the person borrowing has the capacity and inclination to repay. And where no capacity to repay exists, then no form of credit should be extended. So, ask a straight <coughs> question here. Yeah. The, if there is a demand, the, the one you described, should we be trying to prevent that demand in the first place? Or yeah. should we pr be providing a means to satisfy that demand? I think prevention rather than, than cure, I think is a key issue there, is that you can apply any number of solutions each of those solutions may have short-term benefits, but each of them will have long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. So if the issue is lack of disposable income, then the solution comes at this side of the problem. Mm -hmm. How can we maximise income? How can we reduce expense? Or how can we otherwise rebalance a person's um, monies so that the, the, the crisis point is prevented rather, rather than solved at, at, the, at the point of crisis? So effectively, it's about managing demand rather than satisfying demand. We would suggest so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jamie and then Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, convener, I want to uh, turn to the uh, COSLA uh, paper. and It says that, um, there's the, that we, uh, COSLA and our partners, are making some headway with customer perception of what the Scottish Welfare Fund will provide. Uh, and it goes on later to say that COS would have concerns that the bill had a provision to make loans and have leave customers unclear over exactly what was being provided from local authorities in the welfare fund in general. I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that, Nicola, what the, the concerns are here. We've spent significant amounts of time um, trying to rebrand the Scottish Welfare Fund and, we, and we, we heard in the, in the first session that there is some way to go to, to make sure that local authorities are the first places that customers turn when they're in crisis. Um, the, the, the idea of, of, of putting loans back into it would, as I said already, would, would very definitely muddy the water for customers. Um, the, the, the idea that we're a customer's corporate parent um, came up in the first session and, and, and that idea around corporate parenting. 
th that would sit uneasy with local government to be handing out loans to people who we potentially social workers, tenancy support workers for, or indeed corporate parents for. So that's where a lot of the issues that, that, that we come up against in terms of when we sit down and we think about this, whilst we realise there is a that there is demand there, for us we see the solution very much as helping prevent that demand and actually managing the customer's expectations and managing the way customers are dealt with um, across local government and looking at it truly holistically so that they're not being pushed into the, the high cost payday lending that, that we know is, is many people's first protocol. We want people to have spoken to all of the statutory agencies and also look to all of the stuff that is on offer in the area before they would ever think about going elsewhere. I mean, I mean the reason that we have this uh, session uh, is that uh, it comes from uh, evidence from the Western Isles. Mm -hmm. uh, the leader of the council suggested that there should be some sort of mechanism by which loans can be provided. And in their submission to us, they say that they found that there are a number of people who do not meet any of the community care grant criteria but have no way of settling themselves in a tenancy. Properly. So, you know, the question is how do uh, how does a local authority help people in such circumstances? It's been really interesting to hear. Uh, the concern expressed about payday lenders that we all have. I've heard in this place uh, it suggests, and I'm a great supporter of the credit union movement, I've heard in this place it suggests you know, the credit unions are the alternative. I'm maybe picking it up wrong, Mr Neil, but I'm kind of here now, you're suggesting, well, that's not really the case. And I think it was yourself that said, you know, um, uh, solution is better than cure. So what's the solution? question for someone a lot um, more educated than me to answer. In terms of whether local government is that solution, um, the provision of loans is still available in, under the English local welfare provision um, and the local government association down there have published a, an evaluation and in their evaluation um, the way it was working down in England was that the, the credit union were providing the loans but the loans were underwritten by local government. And the statistics are that of 31,000 that was borrowed, only 6,000 was paid back. So it, it would not appear to me to be a sustainable model for local government in terms of um, safeguarding the finances that are potentially available to the fund. I that. I remember, I remember my question was too rambling too long. And just to go back to the, the fundamental, though, so, you know, if the West Isles are saying they find people don't meet the criteria for community care grant, but they still have probably problems settling <coughs> into a tendency. I mean, it strikes me that a, a local authority must still have a role to play. So if it isn't uh, loans, and it can't be the Scottish Welfare Fund, you know, what, what, what can it be? I think that's a lot of the local authorities do have other discretionary funds that they have available to them in terms of their housing or their homelessness colleagues. Um, and it's probably about joining up that support and trying to make um, the best links possible. In terms of available alternatives, we're also working with the reuse sector as well to try and see whether we can get um, as many schemes as we can off the ground so that customers can, can get alternative furnishings as opposed to going and buying brand new using um, payday lending. So that's the sort of stuff that we're, we're working on trying to actually firm up and make sure that we can get the local solutions. But again, that's, that's not the same across the breadth of the country. So it's about servicing and matching up what local authorities can do at the moment and what we can th start to think about in the future. I'm really glad you mentioned there the talk of uh, you know better linkage between various elements of the local authority. And I think I heard right there you were in for the last yeah. uh, session, uh, and I want to ask you a question on the back of that because I was really struck by the fact that not one of the individuals we had before us in our first session, who've all gone through the Scottish Welfare Fund process, of various of them have had contact with other parts of the local authority, housing, social work, be it what it is. And when I asked them the question, did any other part of the local authority make you aware of the Scottish Welfare Fund? Not one of them said, yes, they did. That is a f clear failure, I think, in terms of the system. So I put it to you as, I think it would be remiss for me not to put it to you as the development manager for the Scottish Welfare Fund for COSLA. If we had an equivalent group of people before us in a year's time, how can we ensure that if I or another member of this committee asked the same question, that we would not get that same answer? What I would say about the panel session was there were only two, two local authorities represented there. So, again, I think you'll find that across Scotland there are varying degrees of knowledge about the Welfare Fund. 
Um, again, we are you'll, to... you'll appreciate I and the convener represent yes. one of the local so we may have to be yeah. particularly concerned. Yeah. But, and uh, I, have to, I have to add in North Lanarkshire's defence, it's a standard application form, so they are all, if all of the paper mm. application forms are that length. So just to put that on record, that it's not that North Lanarkshire are asking for anything. And the application form, I think it's a separate issue, though. I think this is... Yeah, yeah. This actually, to me, is a more serious issue than yeah. the application, because we can deal with the application form probably yeah. pretty straightforwardly, but the fact that various parts of the local... You know, when people, constituents contact me, they don't talk about, oh, I contacted the Scottish Welfare Fund, I contacted, maybe they talk about the housing and the social work and the rest of it, but they, they think of it as the council, they think the council is one entity, as well they should, so, you know, how can we get other, different parts of local authorities talking to? Yeah. You know, notwithstanding, I understand and appreciate the point you make that there was only two local authorities yeah. Yeah. talked of today. I think it's something that caused a when we were preparing our submission for, for our, our evidence for the committee, we also met with housing associations and, and um, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, and um, it was something that, that flagged up certainly to us as well, that perhaps knowledge amongst the, the registered social landlord was not where it should be. Local authorities who have their own housing stock, we know that we need to work to bring housing officers on board with that. Um, in a similar vein, um, th there's, there's lots of work that's ongoing with social work departments and actually um, the, the idea of the sort of corporate parent and actually mm -hmm. pulling that forward and, and making sure that Welfare Fund is, is, is foremost in the mind is what COSLA will be doing over the coming months. Um, we still regularly brief. Um, we see the decision makers who actually make Scottish Welfare Fund payments um, and we, we try and make them aware of the, the issues that customers are coming up against. But as part of that wider group, we're also working with... Um, stakeholders, if you like, and actually making sure that we're, we're getting the Scottish Welfare Fund on their radar as best we can. I mean, because it, it doesn't, with the best one, it doesn't strike me as, it shouldn't be that difficult to achieve, because you're not asking them to have to process the rest of it. All you're asking yeah. them to do is say, yeah. there is such a thing as Scottish Welfare Fund, and this is where you go, and yeah. then... And again, there's, there's, there's lots of good practice that we've identified in terms of some local authorities have, have briefed very specific groups of people and it's about sharing that practice where we're getting good results. So some of the authorities have briefed um, people who do tuck-in services for the elderly, some people have briefed health visitors in their area, so it's about making sure that all local authorities are aware of what exactly is good practice and what's going on elsewhere. To, as you say, it, it shouldn't be something that's difficult to crack. Yeah. Specific point, yeah. Yeah. Um, in the main, access to fund when they became new tenants, in almost every case I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, now some local authorities, some housing associations provide that welcome booklet. That booklet with all of the information, when the refuse collection is in the area, um, access to, to this, that and the other service. Um, why is that not happening all over the place? That that good practice has existed in some places for a very long time. How can we make, make sure that that goes throughout the country? And how can we ensure the welfare fund um, is advertised in those booklets? I, th I think that's something that certainly, when I listened to the evidence session, it was something that I that I wrote down to take to take back to the local authorities and actually just make sure that as many of them who, as we can, can get that information out to their, their new tenants. Um, there is still a lot of goodwill in local government to try and make Scottish welfare. It's still very high on the agenda. Um, so I think it's something that we'll take round the sort of housing groups as well and actually make sure we can get welfare fund um, on the agenda for that type of thing as Thank well. Thank you. Okay. And Annabelle. Thanks very much. I want to ask both Jackie Cropper and perhaps first Tim O'Neill about whether or not um, you're already being approached, or to what extent you're already being approached by... Uh, clients who might be, um, have applied for a crisis grant or a community care grant and been turned down. So in other words, to what extent are you, is this already on your door, at your doorstep and, and to what extent are you meeting that need? Yeah. What we try to do is um, not duplicate a service that's already out there. Um, so that's the first thing I'll say about the organisation. Um, there's not enough funds out there to fund everything and duplicate. So we work with other organisations. An example is um, we work with Govan Law Centre in um, Glasgow and they do surgeries um, once a week um, for us and we get a um, huge amount of people coming in and they are doing appeals um, for people. We actually have some customers coming in that are obviously near suicidal, um, not knowing what to do, um, not knowing what path to turn um, and so we, we actually have to intervene 
at that time. And obviously, but, you know, um, the, the, the company us at that crisis at that time and work alongside an organisation that already know what they're doing and make sure that the, 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 they are getting the help that they, that they need and, and that they're being advocated on behalf of. Um, I think that there is more and more and more people that I'm working with that are not only confused about um, what they're entitled to and what they're not entitled to, um, but feel that they are excluded from um, this, the, the actual um, system. We have a lot of people that are in private landlords. Um, that's, you know, the, the, the sort of scattered, you know, for six months and then into another one. And, um, there's a lot of people who are, I would say, um, homeless, but in the sense that they're, they're living in different um, flats. Um, so there's other things that they require. Um, when it comes to actually getting a house, um, and I'm, I'm, as naive as I may sound here, I don't understand if someone is desperate for a wash machine or desperate for a, a sofa, why we're talking about loans. I don't understand why they're not getting the grant. Um, there's something wrong with the system. Um, if you're talking about it, it's a crisis and there's a single parent sitting there waiting um, I, I, I don't get it. I don't get what it is we're trying to do here. Um, I think that we should actually be re-looking at how the grant system works if we're actually having to say if somebody's in a crisis and someone is actually just going into a house and they are getting rejected, why they're getting rejected and why we even consider loans. Does that... Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just, I suppose, I'm just trying to get a feel for the numbers, though. In other words... Um, the people that approach you, um, ha have they already been to the local authority? Have they received a crisis grant? Have they been turned down? Have they received a community grant? Have they been turned down? You know, for, for some people, they haven't gone anywhere. Um, so we signpost, obviously. Uh -huh. um, and we work with other organisations, including the councils, the housing associations. The, you know, um, and we try and make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, Others have gone and been rejected, and that's the first of us hearing um, about it. So they've gone and actually attempted to, um, you know, put in um, for welfare reform. And that's when we step in also and get the appeal. We know it's wrong. And, they, they, you know, it could just be the way that they did the form. They had no assistance. Um, so that, that, that's a common thread. That's, you know, um, for, for the people who, in my view, that come in and end up in such a crisis and end up um, being rejected um, and they feel pretty desperate and then they become quite suicidal. To me, that's what we should be looking at. We should be looking at what's wrong with the system when we've actually got to, to, to this extent. And I'm not talking about people who are you know, on drugs. I'm not talking about people who are on alcohol. That's a different, you know. I'm talking about single parents. I'm talking about families who are quite large families who are really, really struggling um, and they can't see how they're going to get through the next again day. Mm -hmm. um, so they're getting much, much more. But we, I can provide um, some stats. I can provide some information um, to, to this committee, not just now, um, based on what we've actually done and how much money we've actually saved and how some of these people have moved on and actually, like the people earlier on, are now training up to actually be able to help others that have been in a crisis like themselves. Thanks very much. That, that would be useful. And, and Dermot O'Neill, I think just the same from the credit union point of view. Before we answer that, can I just yeah. add a pen to Kevin's point about the welcome pack? I think in addition to saying here is a local refuge collection, I think that pack should also say here are your local credit unions, so that that, estab that relationship is established at the point of entry so that in the future, should a crisis situation occur, then already have potentially have a relationship. In direct response to your question, um, credit unions, I think, it's important to <clears throat> I think it's important to clarify that the typical credit union member is a typical citizen and not necessarily specifically the group that we're referring to today. So I think it's important to make that, that distinction, first of all. In, in terms of the numbers, we are not yet seeing any significant increase of inquiries either through referral or through member inquiries in relation to a substitute or an alternative to welfare fund payments. I think that's primarily because those stakeholders that work with credit unions understand what credit unions are 
and whilst the organisations that are supporting um, individuals um, are looking for solutions, they identify that the credit union might not be the right solution for that person at that time. So it's may, it may be the case that we are not being, ex the movement's not being exposed to that group as opposed to that group not um, being there. So you, you, I'm not even sure, to be honest, whether credit unions would gather information on that kind of information, would you? Um, there, would no, there, there isn't any standardised gathering of that type of information. There will be localised MI, management information, in relation to the, the purpose of loans, etc. But there wouldn't be any mm. Scotland-wide gathering of, of those numbers. But you're not aware that people are being sort of referred on to you um, by, inappropriately as it were, by... It's not our experience. Yeah. And do you ever refer people the other way around? Do you ever say to people, approach you for... Loan. Yeah, you you yeah. should go to the local authority and to do appeals. Well, or? I think um, the, the fourth object of credit unions is defined by legislation is the promotion of um, the wise use of money for members. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's intrinsically um, built within what credit unions are to signpost members either, I'm saying signpost, to educate members either internally mm -hmm. or where that capacity doesn't exist to refer them to organisations, money advice organisations who are placed to support credit unions. And I think what will determine a credit union's appetite to lend is simply the member's capacity to repay. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an interesting point that Nicola referenced in terms of the experience down south uh, of the likelihood of repayment. So both COSLA and the Western Isles Council both referenced the, the low rates of, of repayment. And I, th I think it's worthwhile saying that, using the example I used earlier, £100 lent by a credit union over three months should that loan be written off, it requires 43 other loans simply to offset that one loan. Mm -hmm. So again, that's the, the very narrow margins in which credit unions operate. Even if credit unions were to make use of the legal maximum limit they could lend, it should be 3% per month or 42.6% APR, it would still require 14 other loans to offset that £100 loan that's written off. So again, that's some of the, the pressures are on credit unions. One potential solution um, would be a loan guarantee fund. However, credit unions um, would be nervous about the, the purpose of a loan guarantee fund. So yes, it would insulate the lending credit union from a direct financial shock. But what we would be more nervous about is the unquantifiable damage to reputation. Mm -hmm. from a position of, of avoidance bragging, for want of a better phrase. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the shift of risk from credit union resources to whoever underwrites the loan guarantee fund wouldn't, would minimise the financial risk, but wouldn't go any way to minimise the reputational risk. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. I wanted to ask that very question. Um, do you recognise, though, that what, I suppose the, 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 the amount of loan defaulting in the current system um, is amongst those who qualify for crisis grants. So what we're talking about are people who don't qualify for them, mm -hmm. who are, in, in Western health description, people who actually are on a low income. Mm -hmm. So they do have some means, mm -hmm. um, but they don't have any um, vulnerability or any of the, they don't meet any of the criteria that would actually allow them to qualify. Mm -hmm. But they're not necessarily low, they're not necessarily high risk. Uh, they're, they're in difficulty, but they're not necessarily mm -hmm automatic loan defaulters? Sure. Uh, L loan repayment is ultimately determined by a member's capacity and inclination to repay. Mm -hmm. The DWP undertook a study in 2012, which was a precursor to the Credit Union Expansion Programme, where the DWP identified that there was a million new potential members for credit unions across the UK in the, quote, lower income groups. The same report went on to say that of that million new members, around 50% have current difficulties maintaining existing credit agreements. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at a potential target market or, or space of a million new members and one in two are currently experiencing mm -hmm. um, difficulty maintaining credit commitments, again, we would suggest that it may be irresponsible for credit unions or any lender mm -hmm. to extend more credit and further indebt a member and further exasperate the cycle of, of debt. I think it goes back to the start which is about what is the reason for insufficient income, and let's address that. Credit unions, as much as we want to help everybody all of the time, it's simply impossible, and credit unions are not 
panacea for the financial levels of society. There are more deep-rooted questions need to be answered or looked at mm -hmm. before we look at credit unions as a potential sticking plaster. Mm -hmm. No, entirely agree. Um, just a couple of other issues, though, um, about the potential of credit unions and Grand Central Savings and others, organisations like your own, to help. I'm conscious that geographically you don't actually cover the whole of Scotland. Um, are there issues there? For example, there are other steps the government could take. A loan guarantee fund, I think, would be a step in the right direction, possibly if it was supported as well by other expansionary measures. In other words, if credit unions could be helped in expanding to the whole population as an alternative to banks. You know, I'm sure there are many, many people in Scotland who would love to move from their bank to a credit union if credit unions could offer similar services. Um, would there be a range of, or a package of measures that would make allow credit unions to expand both directions, to expand to the general population, but also be able to expand to cover a particularly vulnerable section of the community simultaneously? Um, there's, a, there are a, there's already an initiative underway from the DWP that injected £38 million into the UK credit union sector under the remit of uh, modernisation and expansion. Mm -hmm. And one of the outputs from that was to encourage credit unions who were so minded to sophisticate and expand their product services, products and services. And some credit unions are engaged in that exercise. Um, whether they will be uh, an alternative to banks is a, is a longer term process. Just now, every credit union is a savings and loans cooperative. Mm -hmm. And uh, every credit union, as you know, is an independent autonomous organisation. So there is no way in which we can mobilise mobilize credit unions as a collective in one direction. It's really to the individual credit union to determine which direction they want to move in. The key question, or the key part of your end question, was that. The only way that credit unions can become more involved and in, in work in this space is if, at the same time credit unions are providing high value long term loans and I've laboured that point because if credit unions um, grow their business model or grow their business through short term low value loans, then what they're unintentionally doing is fostering an unsustainable business model, which leads to grant dependency, it leads to uh, it weakens financial resilience with an organisation, and it, it, it inhibits what credit unions can be. So it's really important that any activity that credit unions undertake is a, is, a, has, a, has a balance and has a spread of membership. We had a, a very interesting presentation from an American credit union yeah. um, just three weeks ago, um, particularly talking about uh, Co competing commercially with car loans yeah. as a model for expansion of very successful. Let's ask Jackie Cover about the, the geographical limit, which I think applies to credit unions too. That clearly, you offer a vital service, but it doesn't cover the whole country, does it? Um, certainly not at the moment. Um, we are in Greenock um, and we're in Glasgow. We've got three areas in Glasgow that we're open up at the moment. We're just moving into um, Midlothian and we're going to be moving into. Um, Clark Manager um, also. Um, the, the idea is over the next five years is to um, widen the scope in Scotland. Where the difficulty lies, which is different, is that we, we don't charge our customer, obviously. Um, and so we work alongside housing associations and councils and get them to buy in our service, um, which we, then we deliver. Um, but the councils and housing associations have been most restricted in what money they've got to be able to buy into the service. So that, that's taken a lot longer for Grand Central Savings to develop. That's where our stumbling block has been. Um, we would like to get out to as many people as possible in Scotland. Um, this is what Grand Central Savings is about. It's about the people. Um, and as long as people need this service, we need to get out there and we need to be providing it. I, th I really would like to do some work also in remote um, areas because I think that, that, that that's something that really, really needs um, some research into and how we actually do a different model um, there. Um, the other thing that we've added in to Grand Central Savings recently is what we call the Home Guard account um, so that we can actually directly pay 
um, for um, people before they actually get the money. So when their money comes in, it gets directly into, to, into their account. We can actually um, pay for things um, such as maybe rent arrears, but we're working with the whole package with the person. So it's a bit like a Janja account. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to expand and offer this service, um, let the councils and housing associations see the value, especially if universal credit comes in, um, the, the values, because we can actually um, stop the sort of money going straight into their hands. And especially for the people I work with, believe me, you know, um, there's going to be a lot of debt in, in um, the, the councils and housing associations. So, we, yes, we're trying to expand. We, we do do, and it is through grant, um, you know, um, we're at the moment supported by the, the lottery. We are coming to the Scottish Government, we may as well warn you, um, to, 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 to see if we can get additional help. But certainly the councils and housing associations need some help as also because they are very keen on us working with us and very keen on us being out in their communities is getting the funding package um, together. We do try and keep it as low as possible. We've changed our model so that it makes it easier because it's getting the service out is what I'm more interested in. Thank you very much. I hope that's answered. Yes, thank you. Alex, you want to, to ask us a short yeah. supplementary? We've sort of moved on a bit, but I'm going to drag it back because I want to ask the question anyway. It was uh, when Jackie was talking about uh, people who apply uh, and they're in need and sometimes they get rejected. It, it brought me back to a comment that was made uh, by a previous, uh, on the previous panel, where one of the panellists uh, appeared to have established that she would qualify for support under the fund in one local authority area, but mm. had been told that she didn't qualify in another local authority area. Now, hopefully the fund we have in place just now is national, and the one that's going to replace it will be national. How is it possible for someone to qualify in one local government area and not another? Um, I, I was in the, the original session and heard, heard the, the, the girl who, who made that comment. I, I suspect it was more to do with the flow of information. We have standard guidance so that the fund should not be different across the 32 local authorities in Scotland. So if someone qualifies under a qualifying condition in one council, the same qualifying conditions will be being used by another council. So I suspect that it's not that the the, the customer didn't qualify. I think it's just that the the, the, the lack, the, the information perhaps hadn't been passed from one council to another, or that the the, the second council were perhaps not just aware of what the customer's circumstances were. Because although it is a discretionary fund, the qualifying conditions are, are standard and they're applied standard across the across the country. So is that something that should work better and will work better in future, or is it something that we should be looking at as this bill passes? It, it, it's something that's improving all the time, um, and again, that's why we continue to meet with the local authorities, um, both COSLA and the Scottish Government meet with the local authorities on a, on a bi-monthly basis. We, we get around the table and we actually look at issues, you know, things, practical issues and, and, and that's the type of things, customers moving across boundaries or customers needing assistance from, from one authority because they're moving to another authority and they're looking for assistance with removal costs. So that's all the type of stuff that we're improving and that we're actually sharing the practice with as we go along. Thank you. Okay, finally, Annabelle. Uh, thank you, Kavira. Just to pick <coughs> up on that point, I mean, my understanding was of the, the particular scenario that was raised was that, in fact, it wasn't a, a question of whether the person would qualify per se as, as far as the, the, the welfare fund is concerned. Rather, uh, it was a question of whether the second local authority was the relevant local authority to receive the application because there were issues of where domestic abuse policy meets and overrides housing policy considerations and I think that's where that issue uh, 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 lies and I hope that there's ways to to resolve that and I, I'm sure that the, the person concerned is going to go away and see with help what, what can be done. Um, I just wanted to, to, to um, raise briefly a, a point. Um, as far as the, the loans versus grants issue is concerned, I think uh, it seems to me from, from what's been said today and from the evidence we have received thus far that it is really only the Western Isles Council that has um, put forward a submission seeking uh, uh, the extension of the, 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 the bill to include uh, loans. Uh, and I, I don't get the sense that there's any clamouring for that for all the, the reasons that have been stated uh, today and, uh, and other occasions uh, uh, from anybody else. So looking at the, the, the problems specifically that the Western Isles Council has to deal with, and uh, Jackie mentioned remoteness and so on, um, what I wonder, we've discussed the, the coverage of credit unions generally and, and uh, Jackie's uh, Grand Central Savings uh, organisation and um, 
yes, it may be over time there will be possibilities of extending coverage of both kinds of opportunities across other parts of Scotland where they're currently not very prevalent or are not in existence at all. But at the moment, nonetheless, a number of people, and it's not clear from the submission from the West Nile's Council how many people are affected, but certainly a number of people uh, are affected who don't qualify for the, the fund, but nonetheless have problems uh, obtaining affordable finance. And therefore, as the submission makes clear, it's specifically funding white goods. Now, I note from uh, COSLA's, uh, from uh, Nicola's uh, submission <coughs> on behalf of COSLA, that there's actually a very interesting scheme pilot project, uh, part of the Scottish Government's Resilience Fund uh, in Inverclyde, mm -hmm. called the Smarter Buy Scheme, whereby uh, it will allow customers unable to access a social uh, welfare fund to apply for new white goods at a lower percentage APR with credit union buy-in. Now, this sounds like a very interesting scheme, and I just wonder, first of all, if Nicola could tell us a wee bit more about it, and secondly, if Dermot and Jackie could care to comment on what they see as, a, as the, the opportunity for such s similar schemes in other parts of Scotland, particularly remote parts of Scotland, to deal with the particular problem identified by Western Isles Council. The by idea is one that, that came from the north of England. It was a consortium there who, who put that idea together. And the way it works is that interested parties, housing associations, um, local councils, will put in um, some, some funding. And then that, that allows the, 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 the issue to be aware, be in the area and, and customers can access it. It's not just customers who have accessed the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, in, in Inverclyde, it's the registered social landlord who's leading it up because they recognise they had a, an issue with tenancy sustainment. So it's part of their um, tenancy sustainment process. And if you like, the Welfare Fund are piggybacking onto it, thinking that's a really good idea and that's something that, that we would be able to be involved in. But in terms of how the actual setup of it works, Jackie, do you know a bit more in terms of because I know you guys are involved? Certainly, we are working with um, this initiative. We think it's a good initiative um, as well. So we are working alongside the Housing Association and the Council, and um, we're part of the Financial Inclusion Group there. Um, so we'll be working with them um, on this, and I think it's an excellent um, initiative. And it, to me, it could be something that can go forward and it could be expanded um, on, and we treat this as a pilot um, at, at the moment. But I think that, that there'll be a bigger take-up on this, um, you know, um, as the, 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 the people said earlier, um, who were here earlier, um, it's much better to be given the washing machine rather than given the money for the washing machine, because we're not 100% sure sometimes. I could give you some stories. <laughs> um, if that money would go into the washing machine, do, 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 do you know what I mean? So I actually um, advocate this um, project in, in Grand Central Savings as, as, as part of it. Um, can, can I answer about the rural area sure, um, issue? Yeah. I, I actually am a true believer that there's different solutions for different areas. Um, and I think in rural areas, in special Highland, I understand why the Highland Council, and I actually looked at the, 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 the actual um, paper, um, I actually believe that um, it's all right for us who, come, who are working in the city centres, um, coming up with a view with the people that we are working with. I think that there has to be different solutions um, for different areas. Um, so, if we're, if, you know, when I'm doing the research work around the rural areas, I'm working with De Vries and Galloway at the moment, doing some um, work with them. Um, that's the sort of areas that, that, that we'd be um, looking at, and I truly believe that that might be um, a case that you know one day I'd be coming back, going, Grand Central Savings believes in the, the, the rural areas, blah blah blah. There is a need for um, a loan scheme, so I, I wouldn't dismiss. Um, what, what's been um, proposed here, I'm a very much aware that, that, that we're talking from, well, I'm talking from the city centre um, approach at the moment, but different solutions for different areas, as I'm a true believer. Okay. Uh, on the geographic coverage, um, there are very few um, patches of Scotland that don't have a credit union um, option. Um, I think the challenge is not whether a member has um, access to membership, but what that membership brings um, in terms of the products and services on offer. And I was also at that meeting in the Parliament uh, from the US representative was here, and I suppose the advantage they have on the Scottish movement is they've got a 30-year um, march ahead of us in terms of their experience, but certainly it was great to have that reference point and have that asp aspiration. Um, credit unions have, for about three years, um, been involved in white good schemes, um, 
primarily under the, the co-op group. Um, however, there are some there are some significant challenges with the continuation of that arrangement, and that the the arrangement between um, um, borrower, um, lender, and supplier is deemed to constitute a, a debtor creditor supplier arrangement, uh, and unfortunately, that type of arrangement means um, that it's regulated by the Consumer Credit Act. Mm -hmm. And credit unions are currently exempt from the Consumer Credit Act and so exempt from the regulation and, uh, or the burden of regulation that comes along with that. Um, an increase in number of credit unions are opting out of um, white goods schemes as a result of the increased regulation attached to compliance with the Consumer Credit Act. In actual fact, um, the recent um, UK government consultation on the maximum interest rate stated that should the rate increase, which it did from 2 to 3 per cent, so too with the exemption rate of the Consumer Credit Act would lift in line with that so that credit unions would remain exempt from the Consumer Credit Act in respect of the burden that would place upon credit unions. Um, so there's a significant challenge for credit unions to remain or, or opt into such a white good scheme because of the regulation around that. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for your evidence. I think just before we close, Ken, could you just for the clarity tell us what that meeting was? Because I think some people thought it may have been something that had been said at this committee Sorry, before, but if you could clarify a, exactly what it was. Big part. It was a meeting, it was hosted by uh, John Wilson, MSP, and uh, had. Um, a visitor from Ventura Capital uh, Credit Union in uh, California, uh, including as well as uh, I think both the credit union societies, I think, or national organisations. I think. It was, it was a recognition of International Credit Union Day, which was on the 16th um, of October, and it had representatives from from both Parliament and from the credit union movement attended. Yeah. Okay. It's just in case anyone who wants to follow the discussion. So knows, yes. knows where the reference is, but it's not anything that this committee has looked at specifically. But thanks very much for uh, clarifying that, and thanks to all of you for giving us information. As I said, it's, it's been interesting to explore that area. It wasn't something that we looked at initially in the bill, but it did become relevant because of uh, evidence that we received. So your, uh, the information you've given us is helpful in our consideration. So thank you for coming along this morning. Thank you. And I'll uh, suspend the meeting before we go into private session. Thank you.